The U.S. stock market just had its worst week in a decade. The Dow fell another 414 points on Friday for a total decline this week of 1,655 points, or nearly 7 percent. That's the steepest weekly plunge since the financial crash of 2008. The S&P 500 also took a weekly loss of more than 7 percent, and the Nasdaq Composite fell another 3 percent, officially closing in what some financial experts say is its first bear market since the Great Recession. Overall, all three major indexes are down more than 12 percent this month. That puts them on track to have possibly the worst December since the Great Depression. Analysts blame the heavy selling on several factors, including increasing fears of a global economic slowdown, an aggressive Federal Reserve, as well as political turmoil in the U.S. and overseas. Tech stocks seem to have taken the brunt of the sell-off, with Apple, Facebook, Twitter, and Netflix all seeing declines between 4 and 7 percent. One-on-one with Ron Paul, outspoken advocate for limited government and personal liberty. What's behind his warning of a potential stock market crash worse than the one that led to the Great Depression? We'll find out on this edition of Politics. Welcome to Politicking. I'm Larry King. Ron Paul is the former Republican U.S. Congressman from Texas. He made three bids for the White House, twice as a Republican, and in 1988 as the Libertarian Party's presidential nominee. He's the founder of the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity, and he's the host of the Ron Paul Liberty Report. He recently warned of a stock market meltdown which he claims will be worse than the clash of 1929. Let's find out what's behind that warning. Ron joins us from Lake Jackson, Texas. What do you base the warning on, Ron? Well, I base the warning on the fact that there's been a gross distortion in the marketplace uh, due to our monetary policy. So if uh, one understands how the monetary system affects the stock market, you can more or less spot, you know, the bubbles and the distortions. We can't spot exactly when they crash, but we're probably in the early stages of it really coming down. But the big problem is, is that the, that central economic planning through the Federal Reserve doesn't work because it's designed mostly to protect big banks and big corporations and finance the military industrial complex and the welfare state. And instead, it goes into different places and causes economic bubbles. The longer the bubble lasts and the, and the lower the interest rates uh, are, are, and this is what we've had, we've had zero rates and we've had all these QEs. So that is the inflation. The inflation isn't when you hear prices are going up. The inflation is when the Fed creates money out of, the air, out of, out of thin air and distorts the market and drives the market and, and, uh, and drives all this debt accumulation. And then you can spot this. And believe me, it, it is big. And it's, a, it's the biggest uh, probably in the history of the world but you, because it's been going on for 10 years. Interest rates are essentially zero percent. So uh, the bubble is huge and it's bigger than anything the world has ever faced before. But the Federal Reserve of years ago, you called former Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan a disaster. You were a little kinder in 2016 when Greenspan indicated it would be good to go back on the gold standard. This week, Greenspan said investors should prepare for the worst and run for cover. It's a difficult holiday season for families affected by GM's decision to close plants and lay off thousands of workers. Today, Santa Claus and retirees delivered letters from UAW members and others directly to GM officials. Priya Mann reports their message to the company is a simple one. Please reconsider. These retired GM workers are hand-delivering thousands of letters to GM officials today from current employees, community leaders, and folks who are concerned about the plant closures and the layoffs. I believe that General Motors knows at some point that it has to stop ruining communities and people's lives. Wrapped in festive paper, these boxes didn't contain presents, but the fears, disappointment, and anger at General Motors. Thousands of letters addressed directly to those at the top. It sends a deeper message about how serious we are about keeping those plants open. Santa Claus and retired GM workers hand-delivered letters from friends and family of UAW workers outraged by GM's decision to close plants in Michigan, Ohio, and Baltimore. It seemed like GM was getting a little greedy 
they've forgotten that me, myself, and the working people, we're the one that kept them afloat when we had this problem before. GM says the plant closures and layoffs will save the company $6 billion by the end of 2020. More than 14,000 workers will lose their jobs. My heart goes out to them. We've been through this before uh, with, um, you know, people being displaced, being shipped off to different cities, and this is a devastating thing for them. The letters are more than just symbolic. These retirees hope GM will reconsider and not overlook the contributions of workers on the front line. We don't want the jobs shipped outside the country. You know, our people need work. Our people have to be able to pay taxes. They have to be able to buy food and pay for a roof over their head. They have to grease the wheels of this economy, this economy in the United States. The House of Representatives and the Senate adjourned Friday night, ensuring the country goes into a partial government shutdown. The House and Senate were at a standstill over a budget deal, and the House's version, which passed on Thursday, included $5 billion for President Trump's border wall, and that was a non-starter for many Democrats. After hours of debate, Senate leaders determined there wasn't enough support to push through legislation that included the border wall funding. That's because the bill required 60 votes to pass in the Senate, meaning at least nine Democrats were independent independents would have needed to support it. Trump has repeatedly spoken out against the Senate rule that requires 60 votes to pass any budget bill. He called on Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell to invoke the so-called nuclear option to force the House's bill through with a simple majority. But that move didn't have support in the Senate. So what happens now? Well, funding for multiple departments runs out at midnight, including the Departments of Agriculture, Justice, Interior, State, and Homeland Security. Trump is holding firm that he won't sign a budget bill without border wall funding, saying on Twitter this shutdown, quote, Government shutdowns can be really expensive. The time and money spent preparing for a shutdown and recovering after it ends can add up to billions of dollars in lost productivity. And a dip in pay for federal workers can put a dent in America's economy. Federal employees are often hit hardest. Furloughed workers have gone weeks without pay during past shutdowns. About 850,000 government workers were furloughed per day during a 16-day shutdown in 2013. After the government reopened, federal employees were retroactively paid $2.2 billion, according to the White House Office of Management and Budget. So what we're doing is we're sending people home for a week or for two weeks, and then when they come back, we pay them, and they, no work was done during those two weeks, so that has to be made up for. But productivity isn't just lost while workers are on furlough. Federal employees can spend thousands of hours preparing for a shutdown and then catching up with work once it ends. If you run a national park, you have to shut down the park and make sure no one can, you know, no one can get in. If you are at, at DOJ, you know, the, at the Department of Justice, um, and you're, you're preparing cases or, or things like that, you may have to delay interviews, you may have to delay uh, meetings with, with, with people outside the organization. Uh, things like that just require time to plan for. Shutdowns also lead to less revenue for the government. For example, OMB estimates the 2013 shutdown cost $500 million in lost spending by visitors to national parks. A 1996 congressional report estimated that it cost $1.4 billion to shut the government down for 27 days. Adjusted for inflation, that would be more than $2.2 billion today. And the longer a shutdown goes on for, the more risk there is that the financial pain will spread beyond government agencies. You can start seeing seeing sort of more macroeconomic type uh, effects, right? If, if just, just spending just goes down for, for a few weeks, that can have an impact on the performance of businesses during that, during that month, during that quarter. About 1.2 million people applying for home mortgages experienced delays during the 2013 shutdown because the IRS couldn't process their paperwork. During the 1995 shutdowns, small businesses lost the opportunity to bid on an estimated 1,036 contracts valued at $244 million. That's almost $391 million in today's dollars. Earlier this year, Standard & Poor's estimated a government shutdown could cost the economy about $6.5 billion per week.